Ride, presented by Longines, is a brand new series from FEI Originals, taking a deeper look into the equestrian world. In this week's episode, we go to Australia to find out about the Equine Pathways program. Show jumper William Funnel tells us all about the Billy Stud. We see the incredible work being done by World Horse Welfare. But first, we hear from dressage rider Sonna Murray Brown about his challenging rise to the top level of the sport. The front passenger in a car uh, in a head on collision and ended up breaking both my legs. It took about four years, about 14, 15 operations. I thought at least maybe I'll never ride again, but I need to be able to walk and live life. For British dressage rider Sonna Murray Brown, the road to international competition hasn't been the smoothest of journeys. I left school at 16 and went straight into the industry, I suppose, working um, as a groom, as a working rider, and tried to just, uh, you know, build up a career and, um, you know, learn from various professionals. But I saw this one guy riding um, when I was about 17 and he was a dressage rider and I just thought, wow, look at that, you know, that looks incredible. I thought, right, I want to learn how to do that. So I got myself a job in a dressage yard. Following a promising start to life as a dressage rider, Sonna's career was suddenly put on hold. I um, was still a young rider at the time and I hadn't, you know, done a lot of dressage competition, but I'd had a really good year beforehand, won my first national title. And I kind of went from elementary to pre-St. George pretty rapidly. I did the, a show in early January, which was like a first kind of selection show. And I won that on one horse and was fifth, I think, with the other. And then, uh, yeah, the next day I was involved in a, I was a front passenger in a car uh, in a head-on collision um, and ended up breaking both my legs. It took about four years, uh, about 14, 15 operations. I thought at least maybe I'll never ride again, but I need to be able to walk and live life. And two years after the crash, uh, I still had a non-union fracture in my, my right leg. Unfortunately, the, the break was really, really bad and um, in a very difficult place, uh, you know, by my knee to operate and stuff. And there was just various um, problems um, along the way. We actually made a lot of effort to find a new surgeon. So he, he said, I need another two years. And that was a real hard point. I'd just spent two years in recovery and, and I thought, God, I've got to do this all over again. But we went right back to basics and um, he uh, did a whole new um, operation and put an external frame on my leg. And slowly, it, you know, it began to heal and, and get better. When I first got back riding, I, um, it was nice because I could just enjoy my horse. You know, the, there was no pressure or anything. And it kind of took me back to the beginning of just going out riding and riding up on the South Downs and, you know, just being alone with my horse and no pressure of competitions or anything. And he was coming back from injury. I was coming back from injury. It was, it was kind of a little bit like it was, it was meant to be, you know? And I do sometimes feel like I'm a little bit behind because I had those four years out. Then I had another year last year because unfortunately I had an accident, a horse fell on my leg and broke my leg again. <laughs> um, you know, I have a really good horse now and um, I'm enjoying it. I'm at a level that I've always aspired to be at. My horse, Earl and Tans, or um, we all call him Early, he is such a trier. He gives 110% all the time. He's just, he's just great. He's so easy to deal with every day, and he's a pleasure to ride and a pleasure to have on the yard. And, you know, he's got so much talent. I hope that he can go in the ring and, you know, show what he's really oh. capable of. I'm going to give it my best shot next year to try and give everyone a run for their place for the Olympics. I, I know my horse is good enough. 
you know, hopefully we can prove ourselves and keep performing and keep improving and, um, you know, hopefully um, get a slot and the team. If I don't make it, then I'll, you know, hopefully give the next year a shot and um, keep enjoying riding at the bigger shows. And I want to just keep improving as a rider and hopefully have many more horses at, um, you know, International Grand Prix and hopefully one day, um, you know, represent my country. Balmoral has been in existence since 1989. Um, I was lucky enough, I've, I've always been a horsey kid and um, mum and dad bought a property that I could sort of fulfil my dreams on. Boy. It's almost more a community hub you know, in a lot of ways. We've got a very big so, sort of social group and it's a very safe place. Everyone feels very um, supported. I think you'll, you'll find anyone you speak to, um, the, one of the most important things here is that community and that feeling of you know, safe space. For over 30 years, Julia Battams has called the Balmoral Equestrian Centre, located just outside of Melbourne, her home. To many disabled riders who come through the gates here, it's a sanctuary. It opens up new pathways to everywhere. So it, depending on what you want to do, anything you would like to do, it opens up that pathway. Yes, it really does open up many opportunities to everybody. We come for, you know, the one thing in common, which is the horses, but then you find this whole other aspect that you didn't even realise exist. And you've always got these um, amazing people to bounce off, and then there's all these other doors open up, and it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Everyone has external pressures. Um, people with disabilities tend to have a little bit more. Um, external pressures because of physical issues or pain. You know, I live with chronic, chronic pain and, and that can really be hard on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if I don't stop and recharge and coming here, it's like you get your cup, you know, filled again. You just come here and everyone's got this common denominator, which is horses. You can't spend a day here without, without feeling that that emotion and and you know from the perspective of parents who who have seen their child in the worst possible situation to see that glimmer and that you know it she's going to be okay that's yeah finding Belmoral of and the EPA program was kind of like a sliding door moment it really seriously changed our life. It was like, I, I had no idea how to make my kids' dream come true. So uh, for us, it really was miraculous. Once they're on a horse, they are the same as everyone else. So that's really liberating for them. And, and you can see it, it's just, it's just pure joy. And, and they're really, um, it, it's an equaliser. The first day that I came here, I'm like, I'm walking in on something. What if people don't like me? And then I'm like, and when everyone started to like talk to me and stuff, I'm like, okay, it's fine. You're fine. It's okay. It's like, I have such good friends here that I just look forward to it every month. For many under Julia's wing, it's also a chance to reach new heights with hopes of representing Australia at the Paralympics through an initiative run at the Balmoral Centre. After Rio, EA hadn't got an active, Equestrian Australia, sorry, hadn't got an active para program in place. I just had a group at that time of, of five or six riders that, that I started with, and I just started bringing in a physio who, um, physio and an osteo and a couple of other people, we just got together randomly. And then in January 2017, um, I thought, oh, well, we need to formalise this a little bit. So I set up a, um, a business and called it Equine Pathways. Starting off with the new, younger athletes, seeing them sort of 
suddenly realise that there's this whole world out there that they hadn't been exposed to in the past. And, you know, that Paralympic dream, you can see all of a sudden it, it hits them. But gosh, I could, actually, I could actually do this. I could follow that pathway. And we've got a couple of athletes who are in that situation now who are looking, you know, probably realistically towards um, 2024. Keep turning. Very good. Change flexion and turn to the right now. Very good, keeping contact on the outside, ask for flexion to the inside. A little bit more active again. Feeling those elbows just hanging down. Good girl. Very good. The whole venue and the whole program, everybody's equal. It doesn't matter what your disability is. There's you know, people coming that have an injury, have maybe ended up in a chair and have never ridden a horse before and they come in and they've got the same opportunities as Joe and I who have been to the Paralympics and I think that's one of the real values of, of Pathways. People have got that passion, they've got that drive, that's how you see the ones that can do it and the ones that have got the money and got all the good stuff but they haven't really got that drive and it was amazing. We will, we will have champions in mm, this group, I can will. tell you right now, there will all be champions in the future that are medalists. She will tell you, I have a goal. I want. She, I think she the 2028 Paralympics. She's like she's got it nailed. She wants that. She want, and she's like, I'm like, okay, let's go talk to Julia because without Julia or without this sort of program, it wouldn't you know wouldn't have had a clue how to get her there. The support from Julia and her team is essential in the development of these young athletes. But nothing could be achieved without the help of Balmoral's equine residents. Well, here the horses are, they're kind and they are very, they're genuine horses. As a para horse, you need to have a little bit more responsibility in the arena, which these horses just take on and take it in their stride and they try and make sure that you had the best ride you can and they really are one of a kind. I haven't seen horses like these anywhere else and you feel safe on them. They are, they are your friends. Well, the horse I'm riding at the moment, Spider, he's an absolute gem. I love the horse. I, I've always found he has always been in tune with me. Like, since day one, like, he's always been, yes, what would you like? And he's always very easily accommodated that. I would, I would definitely say that these horses have saved the quality of my life. I could not have been where I am after the accident without these horses or without Julia. Julia has literally picked me up, dusted me off, and without coddling me said, off you go. I don't know where I would be without, without Julia, without this place or without the horses. It would be definitely very different. You can't help but get goosebumps, you know? <laughs> I'm so lucky that I end up in this situation. There's not many people that get to see what I see on a, on a regular basis and I've had that several times. People saying, you know, if it wasn't for, for your horses and your program, my child would be not here. That's, that's incredible. And the horses have done that. From its inception 22 years ago, the Billy Stud has become one of the most successful breeding programs of British sport horses. We were very lucky that that first mare was a great producer. Um, her first foal was a horse called Billy Orange, and Billy Orange went on to win a, win a jump Super League Nations Cups, and uh, we sold him to Holland, but he jumped Nations Cup for Holland, and he won a Grand Prix. And the next mare we sold to Canada, but she'd already produced Billy Congo, Billy Congo, it's been one of the best horses we've ever had anyway, so all came, we were very lucky that the first mare was top Irish breeding, she was Clover Hill Skyboy mare and she was a great producer and she's still at the back of a lot of our, um, lot of our breeding even today. 
It's important to William and his team that the horses at Billy Stud are raised in a natural environment. So I think with the Billy Stud, probably one thing, other thing that sets us apart is, is that sets us apart is we like to bring horses up in a, in a natural way, you know, in a herd environment. Horses are herd animal. It learns an awful lot from being in a herd a herd environment from as we did from our classmates. We were learning as much from our classmates when, when we first went to school as we did about life, as we did about, you know, horses drink from the trough in order. You know, they have a pecking order. So they learn patience f just by living together. So from yearlings, two-year-olds, they'll spend a lot of time on the land, basically growing and doing what horses should be doing. I think too many horses shut in barns and not running round and learning to live with their bodies because you know it's not you know horses as I said naturally it's, it's roaming it's in a herd so I think for horses well-being long-term well-being and soundness it's important that they are out roaming and doing what they should be doing. At the backbone of the operation is the yard team headed up by Roger McRae. Roger's there to help them, to guide them, to make sure the riders are going in the right direction and the horse and rider partnership is going in the right direction. So Roger, when the, all the young horses jump, Roger will always be there to make sure that things are going in the right way and we've, we've got the right, the right rider on the right horse. That things, it becomes more and more and more difficult to get good staff, so I think it's important that we try and ho hopefully make everybody feel that they're involved, which they are, in the production and in the, the, the Billy Stud team. So I think that's important, you know, and, and as the longer you we're in business, the more the, the more important it is to keep good staff and to have good staff because, because um, you know, in a lot of aspects we're only as good as them. We've roughly, I think, 84 stables, um, between 70 and 80 horses, worked every day here. It's a busy place, but we have a good team behind us, so no, the days, uh, the days go by quickly. From handling the three-year-olds, you need good people around you on the ground, people that know, you know, horses that haven't been handled before, for example, that they need patience, they don't want to be frightened, to, you know, from putting a halter on them, to leading them, lunging them, putting them on and off the walker, washing them down, you know, so, it's not just the riders who are important, it's just, you know, the grooms and, and, and all the people that work here. So, and we're, at the minute, we're very fortunate. We have a great team around us. One of the biggest success stories from the Billy Stud Farm is Billy Congo, a horse who helped take William and Team GB to Team Gold at the European Championships in 2013. To win Team Gold at the European Championships on a homebred horse, you know, is, is fantastic and to, you know, to get high, as high as I did up the world rankings only on homebred horses, I think it's something that probably nobody else has done. So it's something I'm very proud of, actually. Although I enjoy going to an international show and it's great to be in the limelight, I actually love um, working with the young horses as much. So on a Monday morning after I've been to an international show, I'll be up, the first one here, because I, you know, to come see the young ones, see how they're going. We get a lot of pressure from seeing the riders we've trained and brought on that have been at the Billy Stud also. You know, there's a lot of riders that have been to us and left that are having a lot of, su lot of success. The future of Billy Stud looks promising as William and his team continue to develop the next generation of sport horses. The future, you know, I think is doing what we do to, and doing it better. Seeing, you know, more, horse, more Billy horses out there winning. Every time we get have a new bunch of horses every year, we're finding those uncut diamonds and making them into, you know, nurturing them to make them as good as they possibly can be. I think from young riders and young horses, we're going to get a lot of pleasure in the future. World Horse Welfare is coming up to its uh, centenary in, 19, in 2027. We were founded back in 1927 as a campaigning organisation. 
well, the vision of the charity is where every horse is treated with respect, compassion and understanding. And that's, you know, 150 million globally. And there are some real challenges there, getting policymakers and governments to recognise the role of equines, getting people who own equines to have the basic understanding of what they need to be able to do that. So it is a real challenge. But we believe through our sort of activities of caring for horses, through research so we can make sure what, what we're doing is, is informed by the latest evidence, through education and ultimately through campaigning because that's where we can reach the most number of horses because if we can change policy and legislation and regulation that will impact millions of horses. Alongside the headquarters of the charity is one of their rescue and rehoming facilities, Hall Farm. So my name is Sue Hodgkins and I'm the centre manager here at Hall Farm, have been since 2007. My main responsibilities is to oversee the day-to-day -day organisation and running of the farm. The range of horses we have on the farm are so diverse, they come from such different backgrounds and situations. Some of them come in and they've just got physical problems and they're relatively straightforward to deal with. They've been handled, they're used to human interaction, so they're relatively easy to work with and to treat and to deal with. But we are seeing a growing number of horses that come in to us from large groups with herd dynamics that have had absolutely no human contact whatsoever, so they're virtually feral when they come in to us. For the grooms who deal with the horses on a daily basis, it is challenging yet rewarding work. I think definitely taking perspective, um, kind of their background, so where have they come from? Obviously not, we don't always know, so we never assume that they can do everything um, that, I mean, any normal horse as such would. So we kind of always go with them a bit of caution um, and just kind of predict what they could or might do when we're around them, um, which is a bit different than, you know, your everyday yard, being more on the handling side of things. It's definitely when I can start off a youngster or a feral horse we've got in and then kind of seeing them progress through the stages. I think that's the most rewarding part for me. So one of the advantages of rehoming from World Horse Welfare is we retain ownership of the horses. And what that means for the rehomer is they have a permanent support network through the field offices and through the team of staff back at the farms. But I think what's really nice for the rehomers is if for any reason their circumstances change and they're no longer able to keep the horse on loan, they know they have the backup plan of being able to send the horse back into the farm that they've rehomed it from. It's not only the UK where the charity are present, it truly is a global cause. So we've got a big focus in Central America, in Africa, and increasingly in, now in Asia. And as you know, when we, there's so many animals, 112 working million working equids, you know, it's it's a, a real challenge to get even to a, a, a tiny proportion of them. So we recognise that we have to have really important sort of community-based projects. So we're actually in the community, understanding the challenges that people face on a day-to-day -day basis. But then you've got to scale that up and be able to work at a global level, through the United Nations, through the European Union and other national governments to be able to, to get them to understand the relevance of equines. So our work predominantly within uh, low and middle income countries is working with equine owners but also what we call service providers and that is especially with vets, the training of vets is so important and for them to have a basic understanding of equine needs and, um, and, and so on. So we, we uh, in places like Mexico have a really good relationship with a number of different veterinary universities because that's where obviously the process starts but then providing training on the ground as well. Another example is the training of saddlers and farriers which is a, so important in terms of working equines. That's where their biggest welfare concerns are around their, the, the condition of their feet and the saddlery that they're given to do their jobs. And so, for example, we had um, a, a guy called Victor who was 21, disabled, obviously finding life very tricky, but had a real uh, uh, skill with his hands and we were able to set him up, uh, train him as a saddler, help him set up a, a, a saddlery business and now in his local community he's providing a sustainable business for himself, his family but also to the working equid um, owners in, in his communities. 
And it's those kind of stories that really inspire us to be able to go out and tell the story and promote the support that we need to be able to do the work that we do. Thanks for joining us throughout this series of Ride, presented by Longines.